happen. That's our pathway. We, if we increase the organic matter, good things happen, right? Why do good things happen that way? Because we get water into the soil. This week's episode of Voices from the Field is a conversation about Texas A&M University's Center for Grazing Lands and Ranch Management, hosted by NCAT Sustainable Agriculture Specialist, Darren Gauss. The center is a coordinated system-wide effort at Texas A&M aimed at safeguarding the ecological and economic resiliency of grazing land resources and ranching operations. The episode features a conversation between the center's Jeff Goodwin and Peggy Sechrist, a longtime educator for Holistic Management International, about the valuable work being done at Texas A&M and how it will help graziers make valuable decisions. Peggy is an organic beef pioneer in Texas. She and Darren are co-leaders of Southern Sayre's Soil for Water Texas Working Group. Let's listen. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Voices from the Field. My name is Darren Gauss and I am a sustainable ag specialist with NCAT based remotely in Victoria, Texas. I am joined today with Peggy Sechrist, a world traveling powerhouse and educator for holistic management, who also co-leads with myself a working group in Texas for our Soil for Water Southern Sayre project. In that project, we have been primarily focused on evaluating barriers of adoption to regenerative styles of grazing. And that is why we are also joined with Dr. Jeff Goodwin, Director of the Center for Grazing Lands and Ranch Management. The center is a Texas A&M University system-wide coordinated effort whose mission is to safeguard the ecological and economic resiliency of grazing land resources and ranching operations. Today, we look to discover more about the Center for Grazing Lands and Ranch Management and what it is doing to help the producers listening here today. So Peggy and Jeff, welcome and take it away. Thank you, Darren. And thank you, Jeff, for agreeing to visit with us today so we can learn more about the center. I was quite excited when I learned that A&M was establishing this center for grazing lands and ranch management, and really glad to find out you were going to be the director of it. So just take, you know, uh, lead us off with telling us a little bit more about why A&M decided to do this now. Well, first of all, Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to to speak with you guys today. You know, I at A and M's got a Texas A and M has a long history of of providing outreach, education, and research to the stakeholders of the state of Texas and beyond. But uh, you know, I think as we move forward, there's a there's a much more keen interest, or uh, there's always been an interest, right? Of providing sustainability solutions uh, uh, in, in the, you know, in the face of uh, changes in our society, whether that be a climate change or a socioeconomic change or whatever it is, I think we're, we, we continue to realize the value and the importance of, of grazing lands, of ranches, of ecosystems, uh, services, of mm -hmm. the value that that these wide open spaces and these these operations provide not only to a growing rural economy, but also the the services that are provided and beneficial to a growing urban uh, community. And so, you know, I think I think a focus there uh, is is certainly always been there for Texas A and M, but I think with the the sort of reestablishment of this center. You know they're they're putting the the steps forward to really focus on that benefit. Great, yeah. You brought up a couple of interesting points there. Sustainability, and I've been in this field for a long time, as have you. And I think I trump you simply by age. And uh, that whole concept of sustainability now, often referred to as regenerative, has kind of been an evolving concept. Speak to that just a little bit and how A and M, you know, has been viewing this this change and this evolution and its importance that you just referenced to to both rural and urban communities. It's kind of an interesting story. Yeah, I, when you think about regenerative agriculture, for instance, sort of a it's sort of a movement that 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 started, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago now. Uh, with a with a movement towards uh, soil health, 
right? It's right. uh, it was it started so all as a grassroots soil uh health movement led by a lot of landowners. You now we've talked about soil quality, we've talked about rangeland health for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's numbers of publications, but like I said, 20 years or so ago, a group of producers uh, got tired of doing things conventionally and, and getting the same outcomes. And so they tried some things, right? Mostly on cropland situations is what I'm referring to here. Okay. And so, and so they looked around at the systems that were functioning well, and they said, well, what's that one over there? Well, they're looking at a native prairie, a, a grazing land, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A native rangeland system. And they said, well, what's working there that isn't working on our cropland systems? Well, the ground's covered most of the time. Uh, it's highly diverse, lots of biodiversity. It's got living roots year round. They've properly integrated livestock in that system. And there's very minimal disturbance outside of grazing or fire or something like that, right? It's not being tilled. And so that was the, 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 the beginning of a set of soil health principles for all land uses that were really mimicking the benefits that grazing lands provide. And so we see increases in soil organic carbon, we see increases in uh, biodiversity, we see increases in microbial function and soil aggregation and all the the sort of metrics that we look for in soil health. So that's a that's a rabbit hole I went down for for a second. But the the point is this movement is is gone from a focus on healthy soil and that being the foundation for what we call regenerative management today. Mm -hmm. And and so I you know I think uh again Texas A&M's already always been focused on providing stewardship solutions to landowners. But now we're moving into this area of calling it something else um, with, you know, a little bit of a frame around it. And I'm happy to be in the middle of it. I like it. Yeah, great. Yes, it's been interesting to follow the emergence of new information about the soil. And it's really not some of that science behind that soil health principles isn't terribly old. And uh, and so we've been able to add and integrate that into all of agricultural management, you know, and including, we want to be sure we get your take on how it helps capture and store more water in the soil. And then talk a little more about how it's actually improving grazing land, native pastures that, you know, looked like they were performing better than crop land. That's, I get that. That's, that's pretty evident. But we're even seeing some improvements in those grazing pastures with the real um, mindful attention and management toward these soil health principles. So, you know, the water capture and infiltration speak to that a little bit. And, uh, re, you know, re, the, the role ranchers play in improving these ecosystem services. Yeah, remember that last part, because that might be a whole other Okay. conversation we'll have just in a second, but let me speak to the metrics. When we think about regenerative management, I hear the word regenerative grazing all the time or regenerative ag or regenerative management. So that that is, it's somewhat of a misleading term because it's really about applying adaptive management principles uh, and, uh, and around those soil health principles, right? It's a management philosophy. Yeah. It's not a set of prescriptive things that you have to do. It's it's right. really envisioning your management through the lens of, okay, I want to I wanna keep these principles in front of me. How do I implement grazing management, um, whatever the management practice is that you're going to apply sort of within that framework? And so that's confusing to some people. And so when we, when we think about that, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when we talk about soil carbon, for instance, or uh, uh, increasing organic matter or, or increasing water holding capacity. Those are all metrics that we look at to see if we are regenerating mm -hmm. the landscape, you know? So when you look at this from a broad scale across the 655 million acres of grazing lands uh, and croplands, add those to the mix too, we've, we've lost a considerable amount of soil organic carbon, organic matter in our yeah. soils, up to estimates of 
Yes. And so we're trying to implement strategies to help rebuild that organic matter fraction. And so that's really what's what drives a lot of the other cascading beneficial beneficial effects and these other metrics is we're not going to increase orga- uh, water holding capacity in our soils likely without benefiting the structure of the soil mm-hmm. and increasing the organic matter that's our pathway we, if we increase the organic matter good things happen right why do good things happen that way because we get water into the soil right if the if the soil's not aggregated and we don't have this increase in sort of organic matter to create that sponge, the soil's compact, the the water does not infiltrate, it runs off into the creek and takes soil and nutrients with it, right? We don't want that to happen. And so as we increase organic matter by increasing the amount of roots, uh, uh, utilizing different grazing management strategies, we we increase the ability of that soil to keep and hold water. Now, the the question then becomes how much? And here's where I I might differ from a lot of people in that we've seen this, we've seen a lot of figures thrown out there, like a 1% increase in organic matter is 25,000, equals 25,000 gallons of water holding capacity. Yeah. That's just not true. it might be true on certain soils. Right, that's but, what I was going to add. <laughs> but it, but texture is a considerable driver. Um, we we did a study where we measured uh, soil water holding capacity, organic matter, and a number of different soil health metrics across uh, about forty five thousand acres of ranches in Texas and Oklahoma, and we did see increases in uh, over uh, over time, right? So with mm-hmm. increases in organic matter, did we see associated increases in water holding capacity? And the answer is yes. It wasn't at that rate though. It was more in the line of seven to 8,000 pounds or gallons. But it was, it was there were some differences with texture. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, a, a sandy loam site had a greater slope a higher ability to increase water holding capacity with a one percent increase than a than say a, a different a sandier soil or a or a more clay even a more clay soil and so I, I want people to understand that the management here is highly contextual to your operation right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the responses that you see on your operation given the soils that you have might be slightly different than your neighbor two counties or your friend two counties over that's doing the same kind of management right and so those are these are just metrics that we look at to sort of see how how are we how are we actually moving the needle right Mm -hmm. and so from a regenerative perspective i go back to regenerative should be defined as the this sort of purposeful investigation of our ability to regenerate some metric, right? It needs to regenerate soil carbon or profitability or regenerate something, right? And so how do we do that without monitoring and measuring? We have to be measuring something to be able to substantiate that we're actually regenerating something. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think data is so important in, uh, in, in all of this from a from a management perspective to a research perspective, we've got to have the data to make informed decisions. Right, right. Yeah, I love how you are actually describing, you know, what some of us have been thinking about for a while, and that is how everything's connected, you know, and how all of those variables underneath the soil surface all are linked to each other and play a role. and, And understanding those relationships has been vitally important to the whole concept of regenerative agriculture. And so I really love how you were describing that. We've got to have more of that organic matter as an example, if we wanna store more water. And we'll come back to this storing water because it's critical given the type of climate that we're in and what we've been through and where it looks like we're going. But so I wanted to also bring up this fact when you were saying that how much water is captured and stored depends on the soil type. And you were mentioning Oklahoma and Texas, and and I would I would think that we would classify most, not all maybe, but most of Oklahoma and Texas as being 
in the semi-arid to arid bracket, and and there might be soils east of the Mississippi who would where they might actually capture and hold this higher volume of water. Sure. That some of the studies from Australia and New Zealand, uh, you know, have been putting out for the last well, what ten or ten or twelve years, and so yes, it's very site specific, and that's absolutely then how that I think that lends that explains why understanding the principles is so critical yeah. because it's not a recipe we're not all on the same piece of land so how do we apply those principles to our place so i think that's real important and that kind of then gets us to the second part of my question which was the role ranchers play ranchers operating in a you know vast spectrum of different soil types from here, you know, for the whole western half of the United States, but certainly here in Texas to like the the two thirds of the the state, you know, from kind of about about I thirty five and west, and how important they are to climate and to and to the profession of agriculture here in Texas. So, talk about that role for those ranchers that are listening. Yeah, and so I, I mean, I, and I. Don't, I don't want it to come off my earlier comments as a slight that what we found was different than sort of the this this common sort of thought that 25,000 gallons is the earmarked target. That's not necessarily true. And what I said, that might be capable in, to your point, in some environments, some contexts. But let's 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 be reasonable. A seven to 8,000 pound a gallon increase <laughs> in water hauling capacity is a lot. Right. Especially when water's right. the driver, right? And so, you know, if it's less or more, that's it's here or there. But it, that increase is still substantial, and it matters in a in a region prone to drought. Exactly. And so, you know, I like this. I'm, I'm not sure who to attribute this to, but I hear it often. And is this idea that we can't control how much water we get, uh, but we can sure control how much we keep. And so. You know, it's just just this idea of building a bigger sponge, and so a, as we move that that sort of needle forward, I I think there's tremendous opportunities for for landowners to make decisions that are going to benefit their their own enterprise, but then also provide those co benefits that provide these existential sort of ecosystem services that are yeah. um, impacting others. I mean, you look know, 83 to 85 percent of of uh, the landscape, every raindrop that falls on Texas falls on a farm or a ranch. And so that that's the beginning of sort of where our water cycle works, right? So most of the rainfall that we get falls on a farm or a ranch, and how that man ranch is managed can impact how much of that water goes into the ground or runs off into some stream that runs into the Mississippi or Trinity or Brazos River. Right ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. And so so I think, you know, from from that perspective, uh being cognizant of of and knowledgeable about how my uh my or their operations uh are are playing a key role there is important. Um and then we get to this idea around building organic matter, which is fifty eight percent organic carbon, right? So there's this idea of pulling atmospheric carbon out of the air. And sequestering it into the soil where much of it has been lost, and so they can play a key role in in sequestering atmospheric carbon as well. And so, you know, I think there's opportunities for a number of ecosystem services that are provided by ranchers by doing the stewardship that they're applying. You know, whether that be increasing water quality or quantity, whether it be increasing biodiversity of these landscapes or sequestering carbon. I think there's opportunities for producers to not only, again, benefit the ecologic um, function of their ranch by managing towards these outcomes, but also in the future providing some economic return uh, through some of these emerging markets. Yes, that'll be interesting. I'd like to touch on that in a minute, too. But I really want to emphasize that this first and foremost benefit is to the rancher and, right. his, and his bottom line. Right. So as he improves these ecosystem services just on his property, he'll see an increase in production 
and an increase then in his ability to capture that in a ranching situation through livestock. And then for, for the most part, that's true. I mean, it's contextual, but yes. for the most yes. part, yes. But most of the time when we see these operations move in this direction through a combination of reduced input costs or right. increased productivity, if all of the decisions are made to follow on that, uh, we typically see increased profitability. Learn how to harvest the sun twice with practical information at NCAT's AgriSolar Clearinghouse. Get access to more than 400 peer-reviewed articles, the latest in AgriSolar news, and connect with farmers and solar developers who are working together to make the most out of our shared resources. We'll see you at agrisolarclearinghouse.org. So talk a little bit about your programming and about how you're providing this training. What are you offering to ranchers so they can learn how to do this and so they can learn how to make those subsequent decisions, you know, to make a, a broad positive impact on their operation? Well, with the Center for Grazing Lands and Ranch Management, um, our, our first and foremost focus currently is around what I call ranch relevant research. So we want to be able to provide the data and the interpretation of data to benefit and help safeguard that sort of economic and ecologic resiliency of grazing lands in the state. And also sort of the, the ranching operations that, that entrust that. And so, so our focus is working on uh, uh, key topics around, around ranch profitability, around grazing land management, understanding the, 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 the benefits of how we manage these landscapes can in a, in certainly impact those the, the the ecosystem function as well as the economic bottom line. And so ultimately, when we step back and and look at the practices that we employ here, we've really got to step back and look at those principles first. You know, the more I look at and the more I see uh, different operations around the country, around the state, I. I see it through a, a little bit of a different lens in that we've got four primary ecosystem processes happening out on that landscape, right? We've got, mm -hmm. we've got energy flow. And so how efficient is that operation at converting the free and available sunlight that we have into some form of energy to grow a crop? Right. Um, we've got a functional or dysfunctional water cycle. We've got a functional or dysfunctional nutrient cycle. And then we've got, uh, you know, do we have the right community dynamics, plant community dynamics? Do we have the right plants growing in the right spot at the right time? And so when we look at an operation through that lens, most of the time we're trying to implement a practice to, to fix a, a symptom of one of those broken, sis, broken right. systems, right? Okay. Yeah. And so if we, if we step back and look at those four systems as a, a cyclical sort of system, how do we, how do we fix that, right? And so how do we implement practices that can provide us a positive economic return, but also fix that system, right? Fix that wa broken water, address that, that, that hydrologic function, address that nutrient cycle and, and make our ranches more efficient at producing forage with less inputs. And so if we look at it through that lens, it's much more contextually complex than I just need to fertilize or I just need to do X or Y or Z or one practice. It's much more than that. Yeah. And so I don't mean to make it overly complex, but it is a complex situation and sure. there's never one solution. Oh, I agree 100%. And with my background working with, as you know, I've been working in the field with uh, the curriculum, holistic management framework, and look that specifically looks at the complexity of what you're describing. You know, it, it's one of the reasons I think that agriculture, we've had a, a tremendous reduction in the agricultural populations of the, of the country, of the West, of Texas. The complexity has been a real challenge increasingly so as those ecosystem services have become broken, as you mentioned, and, ha and have don't perform as well as they used to, simply because we didn't know about these things, you know, 50, 30 years ago, and let, let alone before that. So uh, the complexity is huge. 
so I think learning about how to manage for that complexity is, is really important. So you mentioned research, so you've got some research studies underway, right? We do. And we then, do. And then how are you how are you educating ranchers on understanding these principles and then understanding how how to contextualize it for their unique location, site specific? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, we're never going to be able to be all things for everybody, uh, but we do our best to to try to take the work that that we're doing and the work that that lots of other partners are doing. There's a lot of good, very smart uh, folks working in this space, and so we try to bring information that's that we feel like is pertinent and impactful and bring it to these producers. So we're again, we're this is our first year of the center, so we've. We've established uh, a strong social media presence. We've reached over 300,000 people in our first year, just trying to get out through the, the various social media outlets. Uh, we're we're going to start a podcast as well, uh, hopefully okay. this year. Yep, and uh, and so and then just you know going to the various uh, meetings and associations and trying to to take the message with us and the, and provide some data and information back to those producers. We've got a number of ideas. Uh, moving forward on how to how to move the e extension or or educational part of the center moving forward, it's going to be working through our uh, working with our collaborative extension uh, agents and uh, and mm -hmm. our specialists around the state. Uh, we have specialists in, in range, mm -hmm. wildlife, animal science, and soils, and and working with that cohort of individuals to try to bring the information to bear. And I want to be absolutely straightforward and upfront with it. If there's something that doesn't work, that's just as important as finding out something that does. Right. And so we're going to bring, the, let the data speak for itself. Great. I love it. And so I guess you're working with a lot of different partners. You made uh, references to to the, all the different specialists within the a and system, but I guess you're partnering outside of the a and system too? We are. One of the the sort of cornerstone pra uh, projects we're working on now we call we call our 3M project. It's uh, metrics management and monitoring, and mm -hmm. it's uh, in collaboration with Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, uh, as well as uh, Michigan State University, Dr. Jason Roundtree and uh, Dr. Uh, Francesca Catrufo at Colorado State. We and uh, and also. Dr. Derek Skasta at University of Wyoming. So what we're we're looking at is um, un understanding those 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 drivers of soil health on grazing land systems across much of the United States. So we've got a a hub site at uh, University of Michigan and and at Noble and at at Wyoming on four different ranches where we're looking at prescri very prescriptive grazing approaches versus very adaptive grazing approaches. Okay. And so we're 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 measuring that over a five year period, looking at uh responses, uh soil health responses, soil carbon accumulation, uh water, soil water, but we're also looking at productivity and uh trying to scale this, our understanding. We're not gonna scale our understanding with me and a shovel, right? So we're gonna have to be able to utilize remote sensing in a much more uh uh, defined way. And okay. so we've got, we're building this foundation at these hubs, but we're also working with 60 ranchers as well. So 20 in Michigan, 20 in uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and 20 in Colorado and Wyoming, where on those ranches as well, we're measuring their grazing metrics, but we're also measuring a, a number of those uh, ecological metrics from plant biodiversity to soil carbon, you know, the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. And we're coupling that with socioeconomic interviews with those producers to help understand what may, drives their decision making, right? Okay. What drives Great. profitability in those systems, but then also the remote sensing. So the idea is to build these models within these hub sites, but then be able to extrapolate those models to those 60 ranches using remote sensing to be able to come up with those correlative uh, response variables uh, that we can so we can better understand those changes and measure them at a at a greater spatial uh, and temporal scale. Now, one of the things that 
I think is is uh, pretty key here too, is that we're not just measuring soil carbon, we're measuring CO2 flux. Okay. So we have eddy covariant flux towers um, on those three hubs, as well as 30 of the ranches. So we have 58 of those flux towers out on grazing lands across the US right now. That's one of the larger uh, projects I've seen with that many soil carbon flux mm -hmm. towers. And mm -hmm. so, we're going to have a ton of data to help us try to understand these soil health changes uh, in response to the landowner's management. Interestingly, we didn't ask the landowners to change anything. We wanted to, we, as we understand grazing management, it's absolutely a spectrum, right? So there's, you know, very sort of continuous high stock or high or low stock density right. on one end, and then we've got the multi-paddock, high stock density grazers on the other end, and everyone's been between somewhere. So mm -hmm. we wanted to study the ranches where they were. We didn't ask them to change anything. We just want to measure what they are doing so that we can sort of build out this understanding across the gradient of grazing that we see. I really like that. That's going to be really important and interesting. How will we get access? How will we, various people in the, interested in your outcomes, uh, be able to see see what learn from that at the end of your five year project. Yeah, we've got uh, a number of presentations that we'll be making. Well, there'll be a number of there's a okay. there's a there's a bunch of grad students on this project, so they'll be publishing papers. And but but there'll be there'll be a, a number of outlets uh, that will be not only writing peer reviewed research publications, but also public or, or uh, popular. Uh, journals and, yeah. uh, and and papers as well to get it out to, to a broad, uh -huh. more broad audience. And then translating it for the guy on the ground, right? That's right. That's right. What, how, what it means to him and her and what they can do, how they can utilize that in their decision making. That's a key point that I, I failed to mention is that these landowners were, were sort of brought in uh, at the beginning of this uh, project and they've been in Intergrain. We, we have we're treating them kind of like a peer network. So we want these producers to be integrated and part of the science solution, not a recipient of the science. We oh, want them to be that. part of the science. That's perfect. And then they'll participate in the dissemination of that information through Absolutely. all the different peer organizations out there. So it'll be really be setting up, you're setting up a peer-to-peer -peer kind of exchange that will go on. Do you think five years though is is long enough for this kind of a of a dynamic the land dynamic with the with the all the variables? I mean, one of those ranches could be in a drought for the whole five years. Yep. Uh, no, to answer your question, but uh, this was a nineteen million dollar grant for five years, so it, you know to, to get those kind of data, I'm sure we're going to come back and try to extend. Uh, okay. with, with and answer different questions and, and try to move this further. I mean, uh, you know, when we, it's a snapshot of time, right? honestly. But, you know, most research projects that you see are two or three years. So at least a five-year project is a little more, uh, it, it's a little better. Uh, yeah. Ideally, we want these long-term grazing yeah. sites to we're measuring these metrics over the long term and we can see a couple of different drought seasons and wet seasons and yeah. and see how those sort of in fact Im impact all of the metrics ecologically and economic touch just a minute on how you what are you thinking about these carbon markets that are emerging and potentially being you know some sources of income for these ranchers that are really improving their ecosystem function yeah I, I guess I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay. I think we still have work to do on the validation piece, the measurement, reporting, yeah. and verification, or the MRV port portion. I think we're in a, a bit of a catch-22 at times. I think, you know, ideally we'd want to go out and sample as much as possible. But <clears throat> the reality is these these ranches are complex, right? We've got a lot of different soils. They're expansive. So the heterogeneity across that landscape is pretty high, right? There's, there, it's not the same soil type across the whole ranch. If that right. were the case, this would be very easy. And so in order to get enough samples on these very diverse landscapes to detect a small 
change, which let's let's be realistic about soil carbon accumulation. It doesn't happen very fast. No. It's a long term increase, right? If we're going to build it, it's it's not something that we're going to see increases super fast. It's a it's a it's what we call a lagging indicator. So we we manage this way and it increases over time. And so I think there are certain environments where we can increase that that carbon faster. And then there are other environments where we just struggle to have enough uh, vegetative turnover, which makes it slower. And those are typically our drier, larger expanses, right? So to have enough samples to pick up that small amount of change over time means you have to have a whole lot of samples. Well, that increases the cost. Mm -hmm. And so that's where modeling comes in, right? And so I think I think we'll end up finding a balance between some sampling and some modeling uh, that will provide us a solution moving forward. I don't know that we ever get away from some sampling, and I don't think I ever want us to get to where we just model. Yeah. So right. I, I think there's going to be we're going to find a happy medium. Now, do I think it's an opportunity for producers? Absolutely. I would also say that there are a number of aggregators out there in the space. So a person should really do their homework before they sign any contract. And matter of fact, don't sign a contract without taking that contract to your attorney and letting them review the contract. There's a number of, and we've published a couple of documents out there on what are the questions that a landowner needs to be asking before uh, moving into this space. Tiffany Lashman uh, with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension has done a, a lot of work in this space, published some documents. King Ranch Institute has as well. Um, we've actually published a document in collaboration with Noble and the Texas Agricultural Land Trust on those questions. Those can be found online. But there's a number of questions. You know, what, what are the requirements that I, I as a landowner are going to have to do? Is it going to impact how I manage? What's the term length? What are the, you know, what are those restrictions? What are, what are my expectations, you know? And so there's a lot of different strategies from different aggregators on how, what the fee schedule or the payment schedule looks like. I would just encourage all of them to seek an attorney before ever signing a, a contract. But I do think it's a potential opportunity for us to increase and diversify income on grazing land. Okay, great. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. And then the a question that neither one of us can really talk to is that is that getting us into a, a net reduction of carbon in the atmosphere long term? I, well, I don't know that either. You know, in other words, it's a carbon credit for somebody else who's maybe maintaining emissions into the atmosphere, and you know, that's a whole other side of this. Anyway, well, I mean, I would say there. I think again, we've got to look at this as a a potential global solution. Yes, so is yes. is soil carbon going to save the planet from an emissions perspective? Probably not. But can I do a better job on my ranch? Yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, when we look at that pie chart that EPA sends out, and we look at the emission sources, agriculture is about nine percent. Well, let's look at the rest of that pie. We've got other industry users, right? We've got energy and, and transportation. Those are the real producers in that in that segment. Agriculture is the only segment of that pie that can actually be a sink. Right. That can actually reduce right. and and re-sequester carbon into that system. Everyone else can just use less. Right. 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 And so we have an opportunity here to tell a better story from the agricultural sector on what our opportunity is. And, and so I think we focus, instead of saying that this is going to save the planet, let's just focus on how we can impact each individual operation and focus on the benefits of our sector. I like that. Now, there's another piece to this that we can't talk about today, but there is some assertions by some scientists around the globe that that could long term and with enough acres could actually begin to mit mitigate climate change. But like I said, but that's, we don't have time to get into that one today. Well, and we've got the whole enteric methane conversation, which is a bigger yeah. conversation to have. Uh, and it's yeah. not just CO2. It's, it's right. methane and nitrous as well. So it's, a, it's complex. Okay. What I would like to know, the last two things is, number one, I, I want to uh, 
I want to find out why this is important to you, why this you've dedicated, you know, it's a professional job for you, but I know you've been in this field a long time and I'd like to know why it's important to you personally. And then lastly, I heard just last week a meteorologist say there are indications that La Nina is shifting back already to, I mean, El Nino, so I'm sorry, to La Nina. That's, that's what I was, had my mind on which may mean we go back into a pretty dry cycle for Texas and we didn't get the real recharge from El Nino that we sometimes do. So the last question is, what would you recommend ranchers be thinking about as we go back into spring and summer potentially with another continued drought cycle? So why is this important to you and a message to ranchers? Great question. Um, so from my perspective, I've, I've had a pretty broad opportunity, blessed opportunity to work with a lot of great operations around the country. I've seen some wrecks too. Um, so I, I started my career working with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, worked for NRCS for about 14 years, left federal service in 2016 and went to Noble Research Institute, and worked as a a range and pasture consultant with them, working with some great producers across Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and then came here in 2021. And I've been here since. And so why is it important to me? It's important to me because I want to help. I want to be able to provide information that helps helps ranchers. They're some of the most humble and driven and passionate human beings that I've ever met. Uh, with a love for the land that that uh, inspires me, frankly. And so, you know, my family uh, has uh, small cow-calf operations. And so, you know, I've kind of grown up around it. I just want to help the industry as best I can. And this is the way that I think I can provide some impactful solutions. Hopefully they're impactful anyway. And so, and so yeah, that's what drives me is is waking up the, every day trying to provide better tools, better information for producers to make better decisions. And so That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so on the on the drought front, you know, I, I think if you're ranching in Texas, you're always thinking about the next one because it's it's not the it's not if it's coming, it's when. And so we don't necessarily break droughts. You know, we, we plan or I put it this way, we plan for droughts when it's raining. Um, we plan to come out when it's when it's not right, and so having a what I call a contingency plan is mm -hmm. keenly important, right? We always talk about the grazing management plan, and you know, are you stocked appropriately? Are you managing distribution and things of that? Well, a key component of the grazing management plan is having what I call a contingency plan. And so it could be a contingency for ice and snow. Could be a contingency for too much rain or increased amount of forage. How am I going to deal with that, right? Yeah, if I, am right. I going to just leave, you know, am I going to take advantage of that excessive growth? But most of the time it's dealing with drought. And and so I I guess I would say that, number one, uh, we we have to ensure that, that we're doing the best job we can at adaptively integrating flexibility in our stocking decisions. If we're out of grass by September and we're feeding hay for five months, we're probably in, in some level of imbalance on, on a native system for sure. And so addressing some of those key decisions on whether I'm holding cattle too long, whether, uh, you know, there's a number of decisions we can make once we've, once we've got into that situation. But most of the producers that I have worked with that, successfully worked through a drought and didn't break the bank yeah. made proactive decisions before it got here right yeah. so they either they either destocked early or they weaned calves early they did something to not be in the situation where they're having to sell the base productive herd you know get that coal that deep and so i think sort of being proactive Having some decision triggers is important, right? And so if I know how much forage that I should grow by, let's just say, June 1st, for the right. most of part of Texas, by by the first 
week of June, we should have grown about 50% of our forage productivity, right? Mm -hmm. right? So if I go out in my pasture and I don't see very much grass by the middle of June, I better be thinking about some decisions, right? And so by July 15th, we've produced almost 75% of the forage productivity for the year. So we're we're peak summer growing. So we're about 75% into our ability to grow forage for the year. And if I don't have that, if I, if I have a good idea and I've used tools like the rangeland analysis platform or enriched ag has a great tool out right now for predicting and estimating forage production. Or if I've clip plots, a lot of people don't do that, but there's other tools that can help you estimate how much forage you have. If I'm behind we need to start making some decisions early. I think when people get in trouble is their primary contingency plan is hope. Hope's not a great plan. And so a lot of us are blindly optimistic, right? It's going to rain. I think we can make it. But most of the producers that I've seen successfully work through these droughts, even without destocking, some destock, some don't have to feed supplemental forage. Um, are making those decisions early. And um, I guess that's where I would probably leave it is have a plan, mm -hmm. have some triggers, act on the plan when appropriate, and, and, and just have a plan to move forward. Don't, don't get in the middle of a drought and not have a plan. That's when, people, mm -hmm. that's, when, that's when people get in a bad situation. That's great. That's really, really great advice. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the interview today. It was great. And I love what you're sharing and what you're doing. And I'm a fan. I'll be following what, what goes on there at the center and eager to learn the results of your research. So thanks again. And I guess back to you, Darren. Yeah, thanks, Peggy and Jeff. Jeff, before we leave, how can um, these producers okay. that are listening today interact with you? You talked about some social media earlier. Yep. Uh, you can uh, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn at Center for Grazing Lands and Ranch Management. I am really close to having my website finished. And once we have that up, I will be able to, to let you guys know where you can find us on the web. But for now, uh, you can reach out through us uh, through social media. All right. Great. Well, thank you. Very interesting talk today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.